Welcome to Bitcoin Fixes This, where we explore the impact that Bitcoin will have in all aspects of society. Today's guest is Anna Chikovic, member of the Anti-Corruption Foundation, an organization trying to root out corruption in Russia. We talk about financial deplatforming that the organization and all its members experience from the Russian government. We also talked about the role that Bitcoin has had on her human rights organization. Anna Chevkovic, I think I butchered you. <laughs> Sorry. How's everything going? Uh, everything just fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Where in the world are you right now? I'm in Georgia, the country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not the state, yeah, the country. Yeah. And it's, if I remember, like kind of an interesting story how you ended up there. So before we get into all of that, mm -hmm. can you tell my audience who you are and what you do? Yes, yeah, sure. I work in the Anti-Corruption Foundation. It's an organization founded by Alexei Navalny, Russian opposition leader. So I've been working there for five years already. But three years ago, I had to leave Russia. So now I'm in Georgia. Mm. But I came here to Georgia for just one month, you know, just to have some kind of vacation. Because mm. uh, when I left Russia, I went to Europe first. And mm. I heard about Georgia and I decided to check it. <laughs> I just came here for one month without my bags, without anything. And now I've been staying here for two years and a half already. Mm -hmm. Well, so tell me about how you got into the Anti-Corruption Foundation and what the story is behind, you know, what Alexei Navalny and his, you know, your foundation mm -hmm. does or like how it was founded and all that. For me, it started in 2017. And the story is really unusual because usually uh, people who work in politics, they have some backgrounds before to start th this kind of job. And mm. for me, it started out of nowhere. It was in March 2017. My friend invited me to join him at the protest rally in Moscow. And honestly, I had no idea what it was about. I just heard that some politician named Alexei Navalny released an investigation video about our corrupt prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev. And I just decided to join them just for fun, you know. And I had a very ordinary job. I worked in logistics and I, I had nothing to do with politics, honestly. So I came there to the protest rally with my friends and what I saw there really shocked me because I saw the police and other forces uh, called Siloviki who brutally took people out of crowd and just arrested them. They were beating those people who were just chanting slogans against corruption. And, you know, the crowd was huge. It was more than, it was around 30,000 people. And mm -hmm. I think for me, it was eye-opening moment. I realized that something is happening in my country that I have no idea about. And when I came back home, I decided to learn all the information about it, who Navalny is, what kind of work they do, why there are so many people in the streets, what's happening generally. So I checked their YouTube channel and I found out all the information um, about the foundation. And the very next day, when I was at my office working, I realized that that's it for me. I can't do my job anymore and I want to join the Navalny team. So just uh, this idea, you know, it came out of nowhere. Mm. I just decided to send my CV and I didn't even know if there was any job opening for me. I just sent my CV and I wrote a letter, an email describing my, myself, my skills and I just wrote that I want to join the team and I, I want to do anything there if they have any, any place for me. Mm. And um, I was waiting for their reply for more than 10 days. And in the end, I already gave up on waiting because who, uh, who replies for so long? It's, it, it took them mm. too long. So I gave up mm. on waiting. And in around 10 days, I received a call from their HR and they invited me for a job interview. 
And he told me that he couldn't reply my email because he was arrested after the protest rally. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why. And I was so uh, stressed about it. And he was just in jail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, when I had that interview, after the interview, they told me that they need some time to think about me. Mm. And on the way back home, I remember I literally started to cry because I thought that the interview went bad. And mm. <laughs> I was sure mm -hmm. that they were not going to give me that job. And when I, you know, when I entered their office, I felt like I touched my dream a bit. I was already in, in, there inside and I wanted to stay there. It became my dream. And after the interview in several days, they called me back and they invited me to start working with their team. That's how it happened, even if I had no political background. But, you know, during the interview, they never asked me if I had any political background or if I know anything, if I have any skills in that field, because they don't really care about it. They care what kind of person you are, what you want mm. to do, what are your goals. And if you want to make your country a better place, and this is the crucial um, things for them. Mm. Well, so let's go back to the protest. What were you guys protesting? Why was there such a big crowd? And what was the prime minister accused of doing? And what videos were coming out? The video was called Don't Call Him Dimon. Because uh, mm. people always used to think that this guy, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, he was a good kind of a good guy. He, he was supposed to lead our country to to make our country better and everything really trusted everyone trusted him and then Navalny made an investigation and people found out that the level of his corruption is extreme it's insane and mm. like he has some palaces and he even has a house for a duck on a lake <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah so yellow duck became a like people br brought yellow ducks to the protest, you know, as a mm. sign of a protest. It became some a sign of Russian protest, yellow duck. So uh, people were shocked, really. That investigation was uh, one of the biggest and most successful. So it was obvious that the level of corruption is um, extreme. So uh, Navalny called people to go to the streets. So that's why so many people came there. Well, so what you're saying is, you know, uh, the prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, he had all these palaces, including a house for a duck. But where did he get that money? What was he doing to actually be able to afford giant palaces and houses for ducks? <laughs> What do they do? They steal money. I mean, Russian authorities in every possible way from every <laughs> possible area. I don't know. They steal at every level of Russian authorities. There is corruption at every level. Mm. So where exactly? I don't really remember because the investigation is uh, was released in 2017. And mm. I don't really remember exact um, events that happened. Mm. But it was clear from the investigation that, you know, amount of houses they have, the amount of uh, expensive things they buy, it's not equivalent to their income. So it's obvious that it, the money come from corruption. Hmm. And how much money are we talking about? Like hundreds of millions of dollars or what of the, course, what's the yes, equivalent yes yeah. hundreds and millions of dollars and we don't even know like how much exactly because the number is growing and growing so <laughs> it's really insane hmm. and i mean russian oligarchs i guess are kind of known for being <laughs> extremely rich in that regard and you know even out in the west you know i think you know there was a russian guy that bought Chelsea football club and you know another that bought like the New Jersey Nets or the Brooklyn Nets now like is this all connected or is it like a separate thing like because there is sort of that stereotype I guess that we know uh, from America uh, of course it is connected because it's 
Putin's uh, policy to have closest uh, his closest friends and relatives around him. So all of those al- oligarchs, they are not just like random people who were building career, you know, in politics or some mm. something like that. They are just some f- friends of his childhood, for example, uh, mm. and he uses those people as his own wallets. So mm-hmm. well, that's why it's hard to tell, for example, how much money Putin has because he doesn't have anything. He has those oligarchs around him who are his wallets. So mm-hmm. that's how it works. And we don't even know how much money Putin has. Maybe he's the richest guy in the world. <laughs> yeah, hard to tell. Okay, so you get into this organization, the Anti-Corruption Foundation, yeah. and, and you know you, you get this job in 2017. What happens next? What are you doing? At that point, we had a presidential campaign. We had elections in 2018. So I came in the middle of the campaign, and the campaign was really huge, and it was a historical moment in modern Russian politics, because this is when real politics began in Russia. Because before mm-hmm. that, there was no competition uh, for president, you know, there was no politics in Russia. Everything was really fake. And the campaign was point of no return for our country. So I came there and uh, in the beginning, they just gave me some paperwork to uh, make some contracts, you know, something that everyone could do. They just realized that They could trust me that I already had a similar experience with papers. And I started to work um, to do some simple work. And step by step, I gained more and more trust. And the girl from financial team, she delegated some financial tasks to me. And after some time, she decided to quit the job. And Mm. by that moment, I already could do everything myself. So... I think in the end of 2017, I already became a kind of financial manager. And we had a huge network of offices all over the country. During the campaign, we opened um, headquarters in every big city of Russia and even in small towns. And I'm still proud of this achievement because we had supporters in every city of Russia. Everyone heard about Navalny. And if before the campaign, there were places where some people didn't know his name, after the campaign, all the country already knew who Navalny was. So my main duty was to spread the money flows to our network. For example, I had to pay for all the contracts for Rent uh, to make rent payments, or in every office we had around three or four employees, so I had to pay salaries, taxes, and it was around 500 employees, around 70 offices. So, uh, the the network was really huge, and I had so much to do. I worked on almost 24 seven with no vacations, no weekends. <laughs> yeah, mm. this is how it happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. So for those of us that aren't familiar with sort of like Russian politics, yeah. how does the electoral process work? And what was the campaign? And how did that whole thing work? And um, how much of it was rigged, I guess? <laughs> you know, our goal was not to win the elections, but to register Navalny as a candidate, because mm. it was almost impossible, uh, because the system works this way, that you should collect some, you should collect the amount of supporters, the people from every region of Russia who should vote for you to become a candidate. So we started the campaign for uh, to collect votes from people to register Navani as a candidate. And everything was arranged perfectly. We did everything. We really met all the requirements. And everything was clear that Navani could become a candidate. But at the end, when we collected all the documents, everything was done perfectly. In the end, of course, they didn't register him. Because if he was going to run for president, for real, he could maybe not win, but he could take the second place. And Hmm. for Putin, 
it's impossible. Like uh, it couldn't happen because if mm. if Navalny is second, he's a real enemy of Putin. He's a real threat. So Putin couldn't let it happen, and they simply didn't let Navalny to be registered even as a candidate. So after mm. that, we, we uh, after they rejected Navalny, we started new campaign campaign for abandoning those uh, elections. We asked people mm. not to go and not to vote for anyone. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Well, so before we move on with the story, because this is, of course, fascinating, can you tell us a little bit more about Alexei Navalny, what his background is, and like this investigation video and all that? He founded uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation in 2011. So uh, it was long ago before I came there. So I think I was even a student, not thinking about any politics and anything. And in 2015s or 16s, I think 2015s, they started to make investigations about Russian authorities, some small videos, and it became uh, like bigger and bigger with more gadgets available. For example, those... Uh, I don't know how you call it in English, copter, uh, that flying over, like, um, you can fly over the buildings with that and make videos. So they used that gadgets to make videos of those palaces, houses. Uh, it helped them to uh, make better videos, to show more, and it helped to gain more views. It attracted more followers and this way it became bigger and bigger. And now it's like the most, the, the biggest political YouTube channel, I think. Oh, wow. And so Alexei Navalny, I guess, does he have like a journalistic background or investigative reporter? Like, no, nothing I, I like can't that. Imagine. No, nothing like that. He's a lawyer. Oh, yeah. okay. But uh, they start like several people just decided to to do those investigations. And mm. after some time, they realized that they need more and more workers to help with this, to help with that, to edit videos, then to, you know, the big, the more content they do, the more people they need. And after mm. some time when the foundation became famous, it was already mm. big. The foundation itself was around, before we left Russia, I think it was around 60 employees, mm. the foundation itself. And... Like we had two different branches. The anti-corruption foundation was one mm -hmm. part of our work. And also we had a presidential campaign that was around 500 people or 500 uh, employees. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's, that's how <laughs> well, it was before we left. Okay. All right. So you're doing the campaign or you try to register Navalny mm -hmm. as a presidential candidate. They reject the application yeah. despite you having dotted every I and crossing every T. And then you have this second campaign to get Russian people to not vote on an illegitimate presidential campaign. What happens after that? Like, So you're doing this campaign. Do a lot of Russian people not vote? What happened? Yes, many people decided not to vote because one of the main goals of Putin to attract as many people to voting process to make him like legitimate president. Mm -hmm. And this was his goal to attract as more people as possible. And our goal was to make people not, not to vote. And there were many protests after that. I can't even remember how many because we tried to attract everyone's attention to that. People went to protest. They went out to the streets to to ask Navalny to be registered for that because they mm. want to vote for him and he's not in the list. So it's not possible to, vo to vote for a candidate they want to see on the list. So uh, there were many events, but of course it didn't work. It didn't work. So Putin is still a president of Russia. Mm. Okay. So then Putin gets elected. I know that what happens to Alexei Navalny at that point? At that point, in 2018, 
nothing special happened except for the fact they tried several times. I think we will discuss it a bit later, but start, uh, I will tell a bit now. They tried to block our bank accounts. They tried to liquidate our organizations because they realized how risky it is to let us work, to let us fight the regime because we could win. So they tried every possible way to stop us. And mm -hmm. Nothing helped because we always found a way to continue our work. And in 2019, they decided to close, uh, to stop the Anti-Corruption Foundation from work. And they started a criminal case against the foundation. They were accusing Navalny for stealing money from his own foundation. That was, of course, it was not uh, true. And when it didn't work, we still found a way to continue work. They just recognized the Anti-Corruption Foundation as an extremist organization. That means that we cannot do anything anymore from the name of our foundation. We cannot start new organizations. We cannot uh, even uh, mention the name of this uh, organization. It's not legal. Mm. So it became very dangerous for everyone who was involved. And we had to stop everything in Russia. And we had to leave the country because of that. Hmm. Well, so tell me a little bit more about this financial censorship, because that was sort of like the first step in their sort of like oppression of the anti-corruption foundation, because obviously it was very embarrassing to uh, Putin and his people. Like, did your bank accounts get closed? What was the sort of uh, like monetary? I, I can tell you the story is really ridiculous. <laughs> I remember that very day when it happened for the first time. It mm -hmm. was in January 2018. Uh, straight mm -hmm. before the elections, two months before elections. It was just usual working day. And I entered our bank account in the online banking system. And what I saw there almost made me fall down from my chair mm -hmm. because it showed the balance and it was almost minus one billion rubles <laughs> there on the bank account. And you know, when you're a financial manager, an accountant responsible mm -hmm. for money, for salaries, for rent payments, this is not what you want to see, really. <laughs> uh, yeah. Minus 1 billion rubles. Yeah. How much is that roughly in dollars? Uh, right now, I don't even know because the exchange rates there, I can check. Ruble to USD. Let me just check real quick. <laughs> All right, so one ruble is about about fifty rubles to a dollar, so that's about minus twenty million dollars. Yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> no, uh, that day I don't I don't know what was the exchange rate, so it's hard to tell. But <laughs> mm -hmm. still, it's a huge amount of money. Mm. Uh, so it showed the minus one billion rubles, and mm -hmm. I started to call the bank asking what the reason was. But they couldn't mm. reply normally. They didn't say anything. Only the ne next day after that, they could show us the document that caused that account arrest. It means mm. that they blocked the account before any court decision because mm. they didn't have the, pay the document that very day. They have had it only the next day. So obviously, mm. they blocked our account only after someone's call to the bank. So in the end, the reason was that the authorities decided to liquidate the foundation. And hmm. the liquidation can be exercised only on the basis of the core judicial decision. And so is the arrest of the bank account. It means they did it illegally. Hmm. And the reason for the liquidation was also ridiculous. And it made us realize the level of the risk we were facing. Because hmm. uh, uh, all the money we collect in our bank account can be blocked anytime with no chance to return it. And secondly, mm -hmm. we can lose the legal entity. It means that we lose all the contracts with workers, rent contracts, and so on. So the authorities realize that blocking our bank accounts is really a tool to fight with us. And mm -hmm. they did it several times. And you know, the most ridiculous thing happened even after that. As I told you, we had two different branches. We had the FBK mm -hmm. and we had our campaign. So we had two mm -hmm. different foundations, the Anti-Corruption Foundation and another foundation serving the campaign. They start to block, as I told you, in 2019, they fabricated a criminal case against the FBK, the Anti-Corruption Foundation. Mm -hmm. And they blocked the bank accounts of the Anti-Corruption Foundation and they blocked accounts of another foundation together with it. But 
those are two different legal entities. They have no connection. They have no legal connection. And Navalny wasn't the founder of that foundation. But, you know, in their perception, like, they all belong to Navalny, so we can just block the bank accounts, just, just like that. Then we opened another foundation. They blocked their bank account of another foundation, but the founder was already a different person. It had no connection to the anti-corruption foundation legally. There is no legal connection, and they just don't care about it. They just block the bank accounts. So it was uh, really hard to work when, like, any moment you can lose all the money and people uh, donate all the time, you know, they, they keep donating and you should keep spending money as fast as possible because anytime mm-hmm. you can just lose it. That's it. Mm. All right. So just to backtrack a little bit. So you had minus 1 billion ruble, you know, like in your account at that point. What was it before? How did it what was the number before? And then how did it get to minus 1 billion? Uh, before, we had some money collected there. I don't remember already how much. I think it was around maybe 2 million rubles. Uh, what I want to mm. say is that we lost that, those money mm. forever. And mm. one, minus 1 billion is the number. This number doesn't mean anything. It, it, this is just the way the bank blocks the account. They just mm. put this minus to your account and that's it. It means that you, you will never be able to recover from that. You know? <laughs> wow. Okay. So you are making, you know, you're trying to do other things. You got this presidential campaign that also suffers the same thing or what happened to the bank account there? What, did it also go to minus 1 billion? Yes. Uh, every time we started in you know, a new foundation, after some time when they found out, it took every time, it took them some time to find out well, what a legal entity we use to stop mm-hmm. it, you know? So we open, um, we start new foundation, we work for some time, they block it. We start new foundation and <laughs> uh, we had to do it several times, really. And every time in the end, they just uh, liquidated the foundation. And um, this is how we had to work. Mm. Well, so how did, I mean, you're the financial manager. So what was that like? I mean, you, had, you still had to pay people, right? Like you had 60 employees in one organization, 500 in the other. Like, how do you pay people? And how do you fund all this other stuff what happened after some time Leonid uh, Volkov uh, the head of the campaign he realized that it is really like it is too risky to keep the money on the bank accounts of the legal entity because you can lose the money you can lose the entity any moment and we stopped to collect money directly to the bank account and we started to collect money to his personal bank account and mm. to a Bitcoin wallet, for example. So mm. we, we were collecting money only this way. And for example, when it was the time to pay salaries, I count how much we should pay this time. I tell the number to him and he donates this amount of money from his personal account to our legal entities account. And I should pay mm. make payments as quick as possible <laughs> uh, every time. Because if I'm not quick, any moment we risk to lose our money. Mm. Wow. So you had to set up some interesting financial things to, yeah. to make sure everything was paid. Yeah. And so they keep shutting it down, though. So what happened next? You know, after some time, when they start one criminal case against FBK, uh, FBK is a short name for Anti-Corruption Foundation. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they start a criminal case and some people got really scared. For example, those people who were giving us uh, offices for rent, uh, they didn't want to have any business with us anymore because if we pay, if we make uh, rent payments, those payments are always tracked. The government mm-hmm. always knows where, with whom we work, who who gives us those offices, who work with us, who are our employees. Everything is under control under their microscope because all the bank transactions are under their control. And it became, at some point, it became really difficult to work because the renters, they didn't want to give us offices because they didn't want to receive money from us. Mm. And every time we had to negotiate, to um, promise, to give uh, some legal support in case of problems. And every time it was hard to 
to negotiate with people. It was risky even, for example, to print some posters. We wanted to print campaign posters. And the owner of the company who pr make printings, he doesn't want to take our money. And every time we had to find a way how to pay for something. Mm, wow. So the financial censorship was pretty severe and yeah. it was a major weapon by which they were oppressing you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what caused you guys to essentially leave the country and what caused Navalny to go to prison? Those are two different topics. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. What made us leave the country is the case uh, when they uh, recognized us as an extremist organization and mm. if you are labeled as an extremist you cannot keep living like before that you cannot first of all you, you, the organization cannot work anymore it's not mm. legal and we we couldn't find any other way because we wanted to continue our fight, but there was no way to do it in Russia. If you do something, if you mention that uh, you work, uh, even if you receive some money from people from this structure, it means that someone is uh, financing an extremist and it's uh, risky for everyone. Uh, and we didn't have to think for too long. We just immediately left the country and... Uh, relocated to uh, Lithuania. Mm. Uh, and the second question about why Navalny is in prison, mm. the story is really long, but mm. and it is really ridiculous mm. because when Navalny, before this politics, I don't remember the year, but long ago, he had his company with his brother and he had mm. just some logistics business. And mm. Nothing criminal, not, uh, nothing special. And when he started to work in politics, he quit that business and his brother was, was managing the business. And after some time, when Russian authorities, when Putin realized that Navalny is, his, it is too risky, Navalny is uh, his real enemy, they decided to use that a business to fabricate a criminal case against brothers, against Navalny and his brother. And at the end, they recognized them guilty. And his brother, they put his brother to prison for three years. And Navalny was uh, recognized guilty, but they let him stay uh, uh, I don't know how you how can, you can say it in English. The, uh, uh, yeah. House arrest or something like that? Uh, first okay. it was house arrest and then he was uh, guilty, but he had to go to police station once a month to check that he's still there in... Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's called probation. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. So mm -hmm. they let him to be uh, free, but he had to go to police station once a month to check that he's still there, that he didn't leave the country or the city. And as you know, he was poisoned. And he almost died. He was in coma and he got uh, treatment in Germany and mm. he was in coma. That's why he couldn't go to the police station to check once a month, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when he recovered after that poisoning, he made his decision to go back to Russia. And as soon as he came back to Russia, they took him straight from the airport to, to prison and they found him guilty for not coming to police station and checking uh, his presence. Mm -hmm. And that was the case while they put him to jail, but it was not enough for them. So they just fabricated one more criminal case and then one more. I don't even know how many it's now, like maybe three or four. And today he is sentenced to nine years of prison. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us more about this poisoning, because I don't know if my audience actually knows that much about that particular aspect, because he uh, runs for president, gets denied, you know, you know, releases these videos. Who poisoned him and why? He was poisoned and then he survived. And our mm -hmm. team decided to make an investigation about mm -hmm. poisoners and what happened in general. And... Mm -hmm. They found out that since 2015, when uh, Navalny uh, decided to run president, 
There was a group of uh, FSB, people from FSB, the service that work for Kremlin. They were following him on every trip, on every plane. They were following him everywhere, all over the country. And Navalny never knew about it. And after these elections, after the campaign, it was obvious that Navalny became a real threat to Putin, to Putin's regime. Mm. So at the end, they decided just to get rid of him. And he was poisoned, but we couldn't, we couldn't understand how exactly, like what was it? Was it a drink? Was it something else? He ate something, like how they did it. And when Navalny recovered, uh, he with the team, uh, they decided to make their small investigation because they already knew the names of the bad guys who were following him all the time. They had the list of names. So they just found their phone numbers and he himself called one of those guys and he uh, said that he was someone from like uh, Kremlin and he asked for a report from this guy. He asked for a report after poisoning. And, you know, Navalny, he has this special skill, you know, when he speaks to you, like, he's so convincing, (laughs) really. (laughs) So the guy really believes him. And he uh, just told everything. And Mm. the, the whole conversation was recorded, of course. And we have this video on YouTube. It's really, it's hilarious, really. Because you can see when the guy started to talk, you can see the surprise in Navalny's eyes because he he never knew that the guy was going to tell everything in details. Mm. And the guy told that they put this po- uh, poison, uh, it's called Navichok, they put mm. it uh, to Navalny's underwear. So mm. after Navalny was put into um, to the hospital in Russia, they took all the things he had, all his belongings, including his clothes, his underwear, they took it. And that guy's task was to wash it. So he told it that his task was to wash it. So he washed it and that's it. It was his only task. So that's how they found out that Navalny was poisoned uh, with something that was put into his underwear. But, you know, he, he survived just by chance because... The poisoners wanted him to die during the flight. Navalny started to feel bad on the plane while having mm. a flight. And the, it was their goal to make him die on the, during the flight. But the pilots, of, co- of course, pilots didn't know about it. And they were informed that someone is dying on board. So the pilot decided to land plane uh, immediately. And it mm. literally saved his life because they landed and doctors took him to the hospital in some uh, random city. You know, those doctors didn't know anything about what was happening. And this is how it happened that he survived. Mm, wow. So poisoned in his underwear, of all things, and, yeah. and surviving and then being brought to prison. So he's still in prison, correct? Yeah, yeah. He's sentenced to okay. nine years, so mm. it's a long time. Mm. And where is he imprisoned? And, you know, what's going on with, like, can you communicate with him? What, what's going on? First, he was sent to prison in a small mm-hmm. town. And we had the chance to communicate with him through his um, lawyers. So they could come to, to the prison from time to time. And Navalny... I was telling him his ideas or ideas for, for example, for Instagram posts. They were writing it down and then they make a picture of of these writings and send it to our team. So Navalny was all the time communicating with us. And Mm. he really made some decisions about our work. He's like a part of the team. But recently they replaced him to a worse place. They replaced him to... uh, to the jail, uh, to prison that is famous for its torches. And uh, they don't let him, for example, now they don't let him to make calls to anyone, to his family members, to anyone. And all the prisoners, they have right for a call. Uh, 
and they make his schedule the way that he cannot make a call. For example, they don't let his lawyers to meet him anymore. I mean, they do it the way they force lawyers to wait for five or six hours before to let them in. Uh, lawyers have to wait there. Then uh, in six hours, they let a lawyer in. And when Navalny has a meeting with a lawyer, they say, hey, uh, you have a right to have a call right now. So you should choose whether you are continuing this meeting or you're making a call. So it's like it's a real torture. And also he told the lawyer that they forced him to sit under the picture of Putin on the wall. They force him to sit there for hours and hours every day. And <laughs> on the weekend, they make him sit under the picture of Putin for like 10 hours a day. Mm. It's a real torture. So mm. now we try to make it to attract as much attention as possible to people, to authorities of different countries, because I think they, that this way they can really harm him somehow. They can make him die. Hmm. Wow. So he's being held in prison after that. The rest of you guys are in Lithuania, it sounds like. What's it been like since sort of your labeling, being labeled as an extremist? So you're, you're out of the country. What's the organization doing and how is that working these days? No, it became really, really difficult to communicate with Russians. Mm. Uh, first of all, it was our fear that, you know, when you're like safe and everything is all right with you because you're in a different country, you cannot make any decisions. Like you cannot ask people People to go to streets to protest to do something when you are safe and mm. it was our fear that it would be hard but the hardest thing is that people are scared to communicate with us because we are an extremist organization and it makes it illegal for example people cannot support us financially they cannot donate money because uh, money are controlled and uh, there is only one way uh, to donate money from Russia to our organization is cryptocurrency. And, mm. you know, some people who don't have any education in this field, they are still scared even to donate in cryptocurrency. And mm. it became really hard to work in Russia being abroad. And we realized that we don't have any tools to change something working in Russia. And our Focus, focus changed to, to become more international. We try to make communications with international organizations, with international authorities. Our very famous project right now is a project that is called List of 6000. It's a list of names of people fueling the war. We call them war enablers. Russian authorities, business owners, celebrities, and many, many others, those who make this war possible, those who support this war, those who don't say anything against the war, who, those who stay silent. And we made the list. And this list today is a foundation, is a basement of sanctions that international, that uh, foreign uh, authorities of foreign countries put against uh, Russian authorities. You know that Russia is a sanctioned country today. So mm -hmm. our job is to help them to put sanctions to those people who are enabling this war. It's one of the main goals today. Mm. Wow. So you're able um, to use Bitcoin to essentially get around some of the financial censorship on both sides. Yes, Bitcoin was always helpful since the beginning. When our bank accounts were blocked, when we were working in Russia, we always we, we had some, uh, we collected some money uh, with cryptocurrency. So it mm. was always useful. We always had some money to pay salaries or mm -hmm. other contracts. It was always useful. Today, it helps us to collect money uh, abroad because mm. people are scared to send money to us from Russia or from some other countries that is not possible to help us, Belarus, for example. Mm. Yeah, I can imagine. The, I mean, like, given what the, you know, 
the authorities in Russia did to your bank accounts that were in Russia. Yeah. I mean, they, I'm sure they would love to do the same if they could with anything else. But of course, yeah, Bitcoin wallets. Um, all right. Well, so I think you paint kind of a bleak picture of Russia and what's going on there. How do you have hope, right? Like what's driving you? What do you believe Russia can be, you know, given what's happening in the world right now? Yeah, it's a good question because some people used to ask me, you work for, you've been working for five years. Nothing has changed. Putin is still a president. You lost. Navalny is in prison. <laughs> you know, like we have so many difficulties all the time. And those people, they just, they, they see this picture, like, but they don't see the big picture because we made such a huge difference in people's minds. Russians, finally opened their eyes. I mean, the presidential campaign, for example. Russians realized that they can have choice. They can have freedoms. And I believe that it's our achievement. So we really make the difference, but maybe it's not that visible yet. But some people used to rely on those, you know, official statistics, like Putin has the majority of support uh, of majority of Russians, like 80% or something. But it's not true. And we just proved it that it's not true. Because any statistics during the world, the war period is not true. Mm. Uh, if you call Russian today and ask any Russian, like, hey, do you support Putin? Do you support this war? No one can tell you no, because everyone is scared. Uh, there is a law in Russia today. It was just uh, designed. Uh, if, you, if you say something bad about this war, if you say something that bad about Russian military, they can put you to jail to 15 years. So oh, wow. uh, any statistics is fake because people just are scared to say what they really think about this war. And I didn't mention, I told you that we have a project of uh, the list of 6,000 names, but also one of our biggest projects today is a news production channel. We have a YouTube channel that is the main political channel in Russia today. And we really change we really see those changes, how we can influence people. We see that more and more people get involved and more and more people, uh, uh, thanks to us, receive more independent, real information. So the changes are happening, but and this, this is what helps me not to give up. I believe in what I do, and I see real results, and I believe that Russia will be free one day. Mm. Wow. So how much hope do you see in sort of like the self-sovereignty that you have with Bitcoin? Like, do you see that as sort of like a possible way in which Russians can get out from under the thumb of Vladimir Putin? I believe in the power of cryptocurrency in it's that it gives so many chances to people, uh, so many ways to escape this uh, surveillance. But the problem is that Russia is uh, the biggest country in the world. And mm -hmm. in some um, small villages, there is even no internet connection. A lot of people mm -hmm. are just simply not educated. You know, they are not educated about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is a real problem. I believe that education is the key. And if we spread this information, if we help people understand how it works and that it's not only a tool to, you know, to collect money, but it's a tool to do something, to do more, then of course, of course, it will bring better results. And, you know, I, I just uh, read the book, Check Your Financial Privilege by Alex mm. Gladstein. And I found out so many stories like ours. And I see that it really helps people all over the world already. It helped some people to escape. It, help, it helps some organizations like ours uh, to receive donations or to help, for example, uh, organizations who help Ukraine today with uh, cryptocurrency. It really works. It really saves lives. So I believe in its potential for sure. It's just about uh, education. People should learn about it. Okay. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. And I hopefully, you know, my listeners can understand what human rights activism looks like on the ground. Where can people find you? Where can people contact you? 
People can find me, I, you know, since um, I worked in Russia with finance and I always try to stay in shadow. I never use any social networks, anything. I only have Instagram and now I have Twitter. <laughs> What's your Twitter handle? My Twitter is Anya Chekhovich. I, okay, Anya Chekhovich. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll definitely put that in the show notes, but thank you so much for, you know, everything that you do and, uh, and for coming on the show, of course. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this podcast. I'm an advisor to the company. I know the team well, and I'm excited for what they are building. If you need multi-sig collaborative custody or a Bitcoin native financial services partner, learn more at unchained.com. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Fixes This. Anna Chekovich can be found at at Anya Chekovich on Instagram. Until next time, fiat the land the best.